Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's tremendous to have all of you back here with us again tonight. I'm Robert Urban. I'm the executive director of the Koch Institute. Uh, we have a terrific lineup of speakers in this inside series tonight. I'm going to introduce each one of them before they actually get up and give their presentation. But I want to say a few words just about what this program is all about. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Let me I'll use this one for now. The Within Sight series is a program that really is the Koch Institute's uh, initiative to reach out to the public. So these events, I hope many of you have been to more than one, but if you haven't been to one, I think you're going to love tonight, and I hope you'll consider coming to some more of these events. Uh, we have this gallery out in our building, and it really represents a fantastic opportunity for us to invite the community to MIT to get a sense of what's going on in our building. You know, we have school buses that pull up during weekdays and fills our gallery with young minds trying to learn what they can about what's going on at MIT. And these evening events are when we bring their parents, if you will, or their grandparents as well to MIT to hear about what the Coke Institute's initiative is all about. It is an opportunity for us to also recognize some of the people who've helped make this place what it is. Uh, Charles and, and Ann Johnson were key contributors to bring the gallery to life, to give us the, the opportunity to have these types of programs. And we, we do through this vehicle, and I hope you, if you haven't seen it yet, sometime visit the website that is the Coke Institute's uh, opportunity to share additional information. There's a lot of content about what goes on in cancer research available online through our website. And these, these events have the follow-up videos. Tonight's event will be recorded, and you can take a look at those presentations if you'd like to go back and review exactly what did he say. You might be able to find that in the the presentation as well as additional content that's associated with the topic. We will have another one of these that I want to see in your mind right now in November. So each year we tend to have four of these programs. The last one this year will be in November. And in that particular program, one of our faculty members, Michael Heeman, we lead a discussion in with others focused on the way in which we imagine the personalization of cancer to emerge over time. It's a very important trend. You'll hear a lot about how that also in many ways relates to some of the ways in which cancer immunotherapy works, because it is very much an aspect of personalization where we use the patient's own immune system to help combat their cancers. And we have some terrific speakers tonight who will give you an update on that. I hope all of you have noticed, if you didn't, you must be blind, these large <laughs> images that are on display in our gallery. And for those of you who not been here before, I wanted to say a few words about how we get those images. As we do with most things at MIT, they are derived from pure competition. Uh, we have a competition in which uh, individuals on campus can nominate uh, work that they're doing to be considered by an illustrious uh, judging panel. We actually have some of those judges here in the audience with us tonight, so we're grateful for them. It includes other members of the media from the club and other art critics along with critical scientists who come in and look at those images, and they're a little obviously too small to appreciate here in this strip of sorts, but also associated with every one of those images is a very thoughtful video that really takes you, if you're interested in what it might represent, deep into what that researcher, he or she was doing. How did they capture that image? What kind of technology might they have used to capture that image? What each of those colors represent? What does it mean to them in their pursuit of some form of research objective to take that picture? And besides that, why did they think it's so beautiful? And obviously, you know, many of our judges agree with them when they wouldn't be on the, on the wall. That particular portfolio is also including one image that's given to us through a collaboration with Welcome Trust, one of the world's most celebrated image award displays and competitions as well, it is available in, uh, in their gallery in London. I'm thrilled to say also that we were able to submit images for that competition and two MIT images are on display this year in the Welcome Collection. But one of their images, and you'll see it named as such in the gallery, is actually provided to us on loan from their program uh, in, in the UK. Again, that's how you get to the videos. That's something called a QR code. You can check that online or check it on your phone. And before I introduce the speakers, I want to remind myself to say thank you to a group of individuals who really also make a big difference in helping us bring this type of programming to you. It's a benefactor group. We call it the Within Society. So those of you who might be interested in helping us make this happen each and every time we do it, 
You can learn more about that. There's a little tab in your evening program. It has a tear off, and you can drop that in a little fishbowl that's at the registration desk if you'd like to know more about being associated with the benefactor group. Uh, you get an opportunity to obviously come to these events, but everybody does. But we also offer two rooms that you can come and spend some time here getting a sense of really what's underneath the hood of research enterprise at the Coke Institute as part of what that group gets uh, an opportunity to do as a token of our gratitude for the willingness to help support this public outreach type activity. And one of the things you can have access to if you donate at a certain level, at a leadership level, is that the within site uh, benefactor group also gets these portfolio of images. I don't know if you happen to have seen these boxes of images. They're now in these cases right now, but if you walked in the door, you might have seen someone up front and they'll be out on display a little bit later. But all of the images that are on display in the wall have been reproduced in very high quality, fine art renderings that are available in these boxes as part of, again, our gratitude for those people who helped this program for. So enough of me, let's start, if you will, in the program. Tonight's presentation has all of the inside solutions programs is broken into three sections. We bring three speakers in to divide up the topic in a very specific way. We start the evening talking about the fundamental problem, most often from the, the mind of a clinician, someone who's seeing cancer patients, struggling with what it takes to bring new solutions into their lives. And we have a terrific speaker tonight, who represents that, and other will introduce will tell you more about what he does in just a moment. Then in the middle of the evening, we tend to give you an example of work that's taking place at MIT from one of our faculty members. And again, we have a fantastic representative here tonight who will give you an example of, if you will, the prototypes that might emerge that can make a difference in the topic of the evening. And again, you'll hear from him how his work influences in very thoughtful and, I'll say, highly engineered ways ways in which we can take advantage of the potency of the immune system. And then we close the evening with people who have, if you will, run down the, if you will, the gauntlet ahead of us. Those individuals from the commercial world who have actually taken technology and done all the things that are necessary to try to do what's required to get it into the lives of people. We talk about products. Where they're at, in some cases we've talked about products that are already on the market. We'll hear a little bit about one of those tonight, a very exciting example, as well as products that are on their way. So we start from the problem, we go to the middle of people who are trying to address new types of solutions to that problem, and then we end with proof that in fact those dots can be connected and solutions associated with that problem can really emerge from places like MIT into the lives of cancer patients. So our first speaker tonight is Glenn Dranoff. Uh, Dr. Dranoff uh, is a, a faculty member over at Harvard Medical School. He trained at Duke, he did his residency at MGH, and then did another uh, program at uh, the Dana Farber, and then a program at the Whitehead Institute, really diving in into the science of it all before returning as a faculty member uh, in the cancer research uh, enterprise of the uh, Dana Farber uh, Cancer Institute. And in particular, his work is focused on cancer immunology for a long time. In many of that time, I'll say for him, was a time when not many people believed that this stuff could work. Uh, I lived in that time, too, by the way. Uh, and now we know very clearly that it can work, and through his efforts running the cancer vaccine program at the Dana Farber, we'll give you a sense of exactly the history of that. So let's see. So thank you very much, Robert, for uh, the kind of invitation to come over here for your kind introduction. It's always a great pleasure to return to MIT, which is one of my uh, favorite places. So uh, the idea of manipulating a cancer patient's immune system to achieve clinically significant benefit has been around for quite some time. But it's only recently, in the last two years, that uh, definitive evidence that immunity matters for clinical outcome has been established. And this is through the work in part of Alan Corman, who you'll be hearing from a little bit later, uh, which has involved the uh, performance of very large randomized clinical trials in patients with advanced cancer that have shown that two different forms of immunotherapy can prolong the survival of patients with either advanced prostate cancer or advanced uh, melanoma. In fact, in melanoma, that's the first time that any kind of treatment had been shown to uh, prolong survival. And in part based upon those exciting uh, results, 
Uh, the community as a whole has been galvanized around the idea that immunotherapy could become an important component of cancer treatment. And uh, you'll also hear from Alan of a, a follow-up study, uh, which has identified yet a third agent that's uh, extremely promising. So just as a quick background in thinking about uh, immunity to cancer, uh, it's important to realize that the immune system really is a, it's a beautiful system. <laughs> Um, it's composed of uh, many different parts, uh, both uh, cellular parts and soluble factors that uh, are produced in the blood. But it can be broadly divided into two components. Uh, uh, one part, called the innate response, is primarily charged with uh, the ability to recognize infection very rapidly, to detect specific patterns that are broadly present in pathogens and elicit a response from this array of uh, cell types that for the most part prevents you from even knowing that you've been infected. The innate response is complemented by a second um, a major arm called the adaptive response. And in this part, you'll hear about T cells, which are a big focus of the work uh, uh, this evening, as well as antibody producing B cells. The adaptive response has exquisite specificity that can detect uh, probably uh, 10 to the 12th or so different kinds of, uh, of, of targets. And in addition to that specificity, the adaptive immune uh, response has the property of memory. And that's extremely important for the development of vaccines, as well as for the durable clinical responses that have now been observed with uh, cancer immunotherapy. I mentioned a moment ago that the idea of mobilizing a patient's immune system for achieving clinically meaningful uh, anti-tumor effects has been around for a long time. And just to highlight some of the, uh, the real pioneers in this field, uh, almost now 150 years ago, the father of modern pathology, Rudolf Virchow, um, first drew attention to the close relationship between the immune system and developing tumors. And then one of the uh, great uh, luminaries in immunology uh, who formed uh, some of our most basic concepts of how, for example, antibodies work, Paul Early posited that the immune system had as one of its major tasks to prevent us from uh, succumbing to cancer, uh, and an idea that um, has now received a considerable experimental support, even though the path to establishing that data was quite rocky. And then the uh, third person to really draw your attention to uh, was a surgeon in New York by the name of William Coley, who first made the observation that some of his patients who had tumors that grew superficially could uh, become infected. And this was in the time prior to the development of, of uh, antimicrobial drugs. And so if the patient was uh, uh, well enough to actually recover from the infection, Sometimes the tumors that the patient had also responded. And this then uh, led uh, directly to the idea that mobilizing immunity could be clinically beneficial. So this was back now about 100 years ago. Um, and Dr. Coley had quite a bit of difficulty in having his ideas established. And indeed, some of the other uh, leading uh, threads of research in cancer biology in particular the development of radiation therapy by James Ewing uh, called into question for quite some time whether or not immunity to cancer really had a primary role in therapy. So um, how does one think about trying to mobilize the immune system uh, to fight cancer? And um, here part of the trouble is that although cancer cells are different from normal cells in terms of many uh, genetic alterations, they retain many features of healthy tissues. So in fact, in trying to stimulate an immune response to cancer, one muscle has to try to break um, the uh, normal mechanisms that prevent us from attacking healthy tissues. So in order to do this, we now understand uh, a couple of things must occur. One is that we must uh, mobilize one uh, component of that adaptive immune response called the killer T cell, which has the ability to recognize very specific differences in cancer cells from uh, normal cells. And we also recognize now, and this is uh, the work that has only uh, come to fruition in the past few years, that uh, beyond just generating uh, T cells that can kill tumors, we have to address 
the normal mechanisms that the immune system uses to prevent damage to healthy tissues. And we also think that moving forward, that uh, the most effective strategies are going to be those that combine both providing a positive signal to generate uh, killer cells and then relieving the negative signals uh, that uh, the tolerance mechanism has. So how does one go about generating killer cells in the first place? Here we want to draw attention to a, a kind of cell called an antigen-presenting cell. This is one of the components of the innate response. The most important here is a dendritic cell, which was actually recognized with the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine last year. And this uh, dendritic cell has the charge of being the educator to uh, convert uh, some of the potential signals in a tumor cell uh, that the immune system might be able to recognize into a form which actually can efficiently generate these uh, killer T cells. And once these killer T cells have been generated, they can identify these small differences in the cancer cell from the healthy cell and mediate an anti-tumor effect. So we've been interested in this kind of approach uh, for some years and have developed a clinical uh, investigative program over at Dana Farber. Whereas Robert says, um, one of the uh, attractive features of immunotherapy is that it can really be tailor-made for each patient. And so in this case, we're taking patients' own tumor cells, removing part of them surgically, and then altering them with uh, gene uh, transfer techniques to make them more appetizing uh, to the immune system, to in particular uh, attract those innate immune cells, the dendritic cells. So we've learned over the years that this kind of manipulation is in fact able to improve the immune response against tumors in a majority of cases. And this can be observed by comparing a tumor sample that's um, studied prior to uh, the immunotherapy, where you don't see many of these small blue cells, which are apparent throughout uh, tumors that are resected after uh, vaccination. So this tells us that the immunotherapy has taken a tumor from one where there's not much of an immune response to one where there's an abundant one. And indeed, based upon these principles, uh, there's been much uh, work in the field that in fact has led now to the first uh, definitive evidence that a strategy like this, trying to improve dendritic cell um, um, presentation of tumor antigens, can actually result in prolongation of uh, patient survival. And in fact, this uh, led to the FDA approval of ProVenge as the first therapeutic cancer vaccine based upon uh, its activity in advanced prostate cancer. But despite getting the immune response going, we know that uh, for most patients, a vaccine is not sufficient to really um, um, mediate important uh, clinical effects. And we now recognize that that's because of these immune circuits that normally prevent damage to healthy tissues. And we call these regulatory circuits. So I showed you a moment ago that it's possible to generate killer T cells that can recognize tumor cells. But we now have to introduce another component into the story, which is a cell that we'll call a regulatory T cell. This cell is very important for uh, maintaining a normal immune function and preventing you from developing uh, inflammatory disease. But in the context of tumor immunity, this regulatory T cell can block the effects of the cytotoxic killer T cell. Now work from uh, many labs, including uh, Jim Allison and Memorial and uh, many people at our institute, um, have identified one of the ways in which this regulatory T cell works. And that's through a molecule that Alan Corman will tell you more about called CTLA-4. And when CTLA-4 is involved, it will prevent this T cell from killing. But Alan Corman and his colleagues developed a drug that is specifically able to block that CTLA-4 molecule. And in so doing, prevent the regulatory T cell from blocking the ability of the killer T cell to destroy tumors. And we were fortunate with my colleague Steve Hody to be um, among the very first to um, uh, evaluate uh, the antibody that uh, Alan made. 
And here I just want to present you two quick examples to show you um, how compelling uh, the evidence is that immunotherapy can um, achieve clinically meaningful effects. This is a what's called a CAT scan, or a fancy x-ray of a patient's chest. Uh, this patient happens to have a far advanced uh, melanoma, a lethal skin tumor that has spread now into the lungs. And you shouldn't in a normal lung have this uh, a white spot or all of this thickening. So this patient received a, a vaccine um, first and then went on to receive the uh, anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. And although things looked a little bit worse early into the treatment, the patient was feeling much, much better. And here you can see now, eight years later, this patient uh, is still alive and in fact is completely asymptomatic, um, not bothered at all uh, from melanoma. Uh, and all of this was achieved with really minimal toxicity. So it, it speaks to the uh, uh, potential specificity of immunotherapy. Here's another one of our longest term uh, surviving patients. This is a patient who actually had advanced ovarian cancer. With this disease, there's a blood test to monitor the tumor called the CA125. And what you can see is that um, for much of this person's illness, there were very high levels of this marker. But after the vaccine and then the CTLA4 treatment, this patient's uh, tumor had a remarkable control. And this is uh, reflected also in gradual shrinkage of a big uh, metastasis in the liver. This patient also continues to do well um, nine years after this therapy. So based in part on uh, these results, um, the CTLA-4 antibody was taken to definitive clinical testing uh, that Alan will share with you the, the very promising results. So I want to just close by highlighting um, two other things. One, uh, which is close to the uh, spirit of MIT, um, is a collaboration uh, with uh, material science engineers at Harvard, uh, particularly the laboratory of David Mooney and Omar Ali, um, who um, had driven much of this work for his PhD, is actually here in the audience today. This is a, a completely new approach to making a vaccine where um, materials, which are normally uh, the components of sutures, so that everybody gets sutures and they resorb, these uh, materials can be fashioned to this small disc, which is about the size of an aspirin tablet. And through a lot of nifty um, material science engineering, important immunological agents can be introduced into this device. This device has the very special property of being quite porous. And that means that if such a device is introduced into a uh, mouse, and now I think just uh, very soon into humans, um, these uh, pores are big enough to allow immune cells to come into this device and then receive the appropriate stimulation by putting in the right ingredients into the device. This device is a very slow release system that just like resorbable sutures will gradually um, uh, be converted to non-toxic agents in the body. And we know now from studies in animals that this device can create a protected micro um, environment to stimulate the immune system for now, we know at least for a year um, after implantation. So it provides durable um, stimulation. And in part because of that unique feature, at least in our animal models, this approach uh, looks very promising in terms of um, being able to control established tumors. So through a collaboration between the Dana-Farber and the Peace Institute at Harvard, uh, we're about two months away now from submitting an investigator uh, new drug application to do a first in vivo trial at Dana-Farber, hopefully uh, in early fall. And then the last point to make um, is that the CTLA-4 story is really just the beginning of a whole new family of therapeutics. Uh, one that uh, Alan will tell you more about uh, is called PD-1. This is a cousin of CTLA-4. It also has very important uh, functions in inhibiting uh, tumor immunity. And to highlight how far this field has come, as, as Robert uh, mentioned at the beginning, there was tremendous um, skepticism, uh, even in up to the last, uh, I'd say, five years that this approach could be promising. But now, based upon the success of the vaccine and ibilumumab, 
There are uh, five different major pharmaceutical companies developing therapeutic reagents against this pathway with, with Alex, uh, and Bonnie being uh, the lead. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Try this one more time. We do have a little time for questions. Many of you have a question. If you do, we do have some microphones. I'd like to have them sort of handed to you so we can capture what you say on, on the video as well. Any, any interesting questions? Uh, that's Dr. Brown. Well, try. <laughs> I don't think I can. No, we'll give it. Well, uh, this T cell you're talking about, is it going to be a manufactured T cell that you're going to introduce into the body? Or is it something you're going to be able to generate within the person somehow? That's a very sophisticated okay. question, and I, I don't think you needed to be uh, hesitant about posing that at all. Um, um, these approaches are aimed at enhancing the T cells that are in the body. So um, uh, the idea is that if you could learn what are the normal control points that um, determine how these T cells function, it could be possible to make a pharmaceutical kind of drug that could be given to a patient to alter the function of the T cells in the patient without having to do any manipulations outside of the body. So that's what these approaches are focused on. But having said that, um, we know that one of the most effective forms of immunotherapy prior to this class has been bone marrow transplantation. Now bone marrow transplantation takes uh, blood cells from a healthy person and introduces them into a patient with cancer. And we know that that treatment can be curative for a significant number of patients, particularly with blood cancers like leukemia and lymphoma. In that case, the major active ingredient turns out to be the T cells from the healthy person put into the um, um, a recipient. So that's a form of, um, um, a transfer of, of cells where a manipulation has been done outside of the body into a patient that we know works. Um, there's a lot of excitement, and you'll hear um, uh, perhaps some of this from uh, Daryl, of uh, um, um, making uh, patient T cells work better by taking them out of the body and engineering them, either using gene manipulations or more sophisticated uh, approaches that uh, Dr. Irvine has developed. And um, there have been some very promising uh, results reported recently for such strategies. For example, the New York Times highlighted an approach out of uh, a Pennsylvania Medical School last year in leukemia, uh, work from a, a colleague, Dr. Carl June. So uh, both approaches have great merit. Ultimately, it would be easier to deliver a standardized uh, drug uh, to large numbers of patients versus having to do all the engineering of cells uh, on a patient uh, on an individual basis. But given the pace of advances in uh, engineering technology, I'm not, I'm not sure that it won't uh, um, uh, in the future become much simpler, so that that, that might be possible. Thank you. Any other questions? Isn't there a worry that if you isn't there a worry that if you and, and are, or inhibit the uh, control that you'll end up with autoimmune diseases? Yes, that's another excellent question. Um, um, indeed, all of cancer immunotherapeutic approaches have to worry about the balance of selectively targeting the tumor versus causing collateral damage. Uh, to healthy tissues. And um, the CTLA-4 molecule uh, that uh, uh, we, we, we reviewed is absolutely required for maintaining a healthy immune system that doesn't attack uh, uh, the body. If you make a animal that lacks that um, single factor, that single CTLA-4, it will die at a young age. 
because of immune attack against itself. So that teaches that it's very important to achieve a therapeutic index where there is preferential reactivity of the tumor over the healthy tissues. And that's an area which uh, I think is ripe for a further development because um, if you can enhance an immune response against a tumor, for example, with a vaccine or maybe an adoptive cellular therapy, it could very well be possible that you need less of the blocking drug against CTLA-4 than if you don't have any of those cells present at all. And if you use less of the drug, there's going to be fewer side effects. Currently, the CTLA-4 drug that was approved is associated with about a 15 um, to 20 percent um, um, frequency of significant side effects. Those side effects are now uh, almost always readily managed. Um, sometimes, in uh, the worst cases, patients have to take uh, a steroid medicine to suppress the immunity. Um, but as there's been a, a very steep learning curve on, on learning how to use these drugs, the side effect profile is uh, really uh, been, uh, diminished quite a bit. And that, importantly, with the CTLA-4, about 15% of advanced melanoma patients have a real chance at long-term benefit. So most people who have a difficult clinical problem would be willing to take a risk of some toxicity if they have a real chance of benefit. Some of the newer ones, like you'll hear from Alan uh, with the PD-1, have even a better uh, toxicity profile than uh, the CTLA-4. But I think as we learn more about how to focus the immune response against the tumor, the toxicity curve, the concerns will be very bad. I think we have one more with a, with a uh, is there one right there in the back? I don't think that's working quite well. Maybe a little louder. Yeah. I don't know if it's Those smart uh, uh, pills 
uh, could be very complementary to the kinds of uh, treatments that uh, are being developed now, and that may even uh, further broaden uh, the scope of tumor types that uh, could be responsive to, to combined therapy. What do we do? One more. We have all done. Okay. Well, we can move along, and you know, the speakers will be here afterwards. We can have an opportunity for you to speak with them as well. So let me introduce our. Our next speaker, uh, Professor Daryl Irvine, it's important for me to be able to say, is one of our own. Uh, Daryl uh, has a PhD at MIT before going on to Stanford to do his postdoctoral training, and then being recruited back to MIT to be a, a faculty member. Uh, he is one of our faculty members from the School of Engineering. I may not have mentioned this or you may not have seen it before, but the Koch Institute is an explicit collaboration between the School of Science at MIT and the School of Engineering. So in this building, our faculty are equivalently distributed between those two schools being brought together by virtue of ability to collaborate in ways that this interdisciplinary type of project can really very forcefully represent. So Daryl's a great example of one of our engineers, but a card carrying, maybe even more than that, an immunologist, and so he's certainly a, a very forceful biologist as well. So he's a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a professor in both the departments of uh, bio, uh, medical engineering and material science, and a member of the Radon Institute, a group that also uh, does this type of work on behalf of HIV. So no further ado, there. Thank you, Eric. So I'm going to tell you about some work that we're doing that's that's uh, not nearly as far along as, as what Alan is going to tell you about in a few minutes. Uh, work that's still in the early stages, uh, trying to use some of the information that we've learned about the immune system in the last 15 years, um, which Glenn introduced, uh, to design new therapeutic strategies to treat uh, advanced cancer. And to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, so I was trained, my PhD is in material science, actually, um, uh, and I moved from material science into uh, training in immunology as a postdoc. And so I'm going to show you one example of how we sort of blend those two fields uh, to think about new treatments. And the story I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to focus on one uh, particular approach for uh, treatment of cancer called adoptive uh, cell therapy. And this is uh, related to the strategy of bone ma marrow transplantation that Glenn mentioned, um, where the idea is to get a patient's own immune system uh, doing a better job of going after their cancer. And this is done by um, isolating a tumor biopsy, for example, um, as a way to isolate T cells from that patient that can recognize the patient's own tumor and by treating those with uh, drugs and cell culture, we grow those up into large numbers, uh, maybe 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th cells, and infuse those back into the patient in the hopes that they would distribute throughout the body and sort of carry out their intrinsic function of hunting down tumor cells and destroying them. And this approach has been uh, shown to have some pretty impressive and dramatic results in, in small clinical trials. Um, this is work from the National Cancer Institute showing uh, uh, massive lesions that are, that are destroyed just a few days after starting uh, a T-cell therapy. And it's been shown that these T-cells can crawl into uh, distant internal organs, like these are melanoma metastases in the liver that have been eliminated after a month uh, uh, starting the treatment and that remain gone for many years. And this uh, attests to the, the, phenot the uh, aspect of memory that Glenn mentioned uh, that's important in immunotherapy. So this looks like a very uh, promising treatment. Now, one of the limitations is that these responses aren't seen in every patient, and the goal is, is to move this toward 100% of the patients having responses like this. And so I just want to come back to this, this chief limitation that, that uh, Dr. Dranoff introduced, and that's that um, when we have a, a solid tumor and one of our transferred T cells crawls into that environment, it's faced with a very hostile environment that's actually quite different from uh, the case when a T cell is, uh, for example, entering a site of infection. In this tumor environment, there are a whole host of factors that are endogenous factors that the immune system normally uses 
to turn an immune response off when it's, for example, coming to the end of an infection that the immune system is clear. And so the, the tumor exploits all of these strategies that the immune system normally uses to keep itself under control and uses it to shut down uh, the tumor response. So this is soluble factors, small molecules, um, and so forth. And in addition, um, even your own host immune cells that might normally be helping the immune system clear the disease if it was an infection, here get co-opted by the tumor and turned into uh, what people will often call tumor-associated immune cells that are, uh, again, producing a whole host of suppressive factors that are shutting down the T-cell response. So even when I infuse into a, uh, a, a recipient a very potently charged batch of T-cells, they have to deal with the suppressive environment that they face um, in vivo. And this is a major limiting factor in the immune response that you'd see with, even with adoptive cell therapy. So how this is dealt with in the clinic at the moment is to combine the T-cell transfer with um, one of a, a variety of different possible adjuvant treatments that one of their functions is to deal with the suppressive environment of the tumor. Now the unfortunate uh, issue is that um, the lesions may be distributed throughout your body, but the therapies that we have to combine with the T-cells to overcome the suppressive nature of the tumor environment um, we administer in a sort of whole body fashion. So we'll give drugs like interleukin-2 um, that we infuse systemically and they go through everywhere throughout the body. We give uh, chemotherapy, in some cases they give radiation therapy. And the problem is, although these strategies can all help boost the T-cell response against the tumor by alleviating some of these blockades, um, they also come with a significant uh, list of side effects, which can be very serious. And, and in fact, for example, in the case of IL-2, the side effects from IL-2 limit the list of patients who can qualify to even receive the therapy. So thinking about this strategy, it's the right idea. You're trying to remove some of the blockading signals in the tumor um, with these treatments to, so that the T cells can carry out their job. But really what you might like to do is focus uh, signals like are provided by IL-2 directly your donor T cells so that rather than bathing the patient in these toxic drugs, we could focus them on the cells that they're intended for to keep them going. And, and this is where our sort of engineering approach came in because we thought about what if we could transfer T cells into a patient and instead of uh, giving them systemic drug, let's give them a supporting drug that the T cell carries with it, each individual cell. Uh, having a little suitcase of drug attached to the cell surface in the form of a, a nanoparticle that could be loaded with a drug that would slowly come out. And now we'd be talking about such a tiny dose of drug because we need such a tiny dose to stimulate the cell's own receptors that we could perhaps avoid stimulating any other cells, even those very nearby, um, and thus eliminate the, the side effects that we're worried about. And wherever these uh, particle modified cells with traffic, they could carry this drug with them in the blood as they go into the tumor. If they're in the lymph nodes getting primed to go after the tumor, um, they'd, they'd be consistently receiving that little uh, suitcase of message that keeps them going and, and essentially shields them from the negative signals in the tumor environment. So I'm going to show you uh, sort of the steps we've taken, the very early steps of trying to explore this idea as a way um, to deal with uh, metastatic cancer. So the, the engineering, the materials engineering that comes in is the answering the question, well, how do we do this? How do we package a drug into a carrier that can go right on the surface of the cell? And the way we've done this is we use either biodegradable uh, polymers that are, uh, again, made of these materials, for example, that resorbable sutures are made from, or we use uh, lipid capsules that are essentially made from the same material that your cells are made from as uh, little capsules that can be loaded with a drug in the core, and that drug can slowly leak out over time. And we link these to cells by basically using the cell's own surface proteins as a chemical handhold and make particles that will react with cell surface proteins so that just by mixing T cells with nanoparticles in these micrographs that are shown in blue, that link spontaneously to the cell surface. So the idea for the clinician would be they prepare their T cells, mix in the particles, they link to the cell surface, and then you're ready to go um, into the 
recipient. And uh, uh, strikingly, what we see is there's a, a whole interesting biology of what happens when you link these little drug carriers onto a T cell. So when a T cell is migrating through tissue, they take on this hand mirror morphology, and they have a tail here at the back called a uropod. And the T cell is not uh, passive in this process. When we link these drug-loaded carriers onto the T cell, they traffic with the cell's cell surface proteins. And when a T cell starts migrating, it moves a lot of its uh, uh, proteins to the rear of the cell, so they're sort of out of the way as the cell's migrating. And you see that in these uh, videos of T cells crawling through uh, uh, a matrix, a, a mimic of tissue. They, they move the particles out of the way to the rear, but when they find a tumor cell, something very different happens. Many of these proteins that we've linked these particles to will get reoriented into the interface as the T cell is interacting with the tumor. So here's a T cell. It's found a tumor cell. And you'll see a, this is over uh, minutes and uh, hours and minutes here of real time. You see the T cell, this blue speckling that's dancing around in the interface is the T cell move these particles into the interface. So this is a sort of a side effect of the way we link to the T cell, but you can start imagining now we can use this to deliver drugs directly to the interface as the T cell is getting ready to kill that uh, tumor cell. Okay, now uh, the next question is, does this work in, in vivo? And so we've taken this into small animal models in mice, and what we find is if we link particles onto T cells, um, and then look in tissue. So this is a prostate cancer model where we've injected into prostate cancer bearing mice either free nanoparticles, T cells by themselves, or T cells that are carrying nanoparticles. And then we took the prostates out a few days later to see by fluorescence imaging whether the particles got into the tissue. And you see right away that the particles alone, without being guided, have a very poor efficiency of finding their way to the tumor. But if the T cells are carrying them there, you see this massive signal accumulating. And if we uh, take tumors out and cut them open and look in thin slices, um, here where we've treated a tumor with T cells, and the T cells are in green here, and in purple we're looking at the nanoparticles that were linked to these T cells, you see the T cells have infiltrated all throughout the tumor, and Particles have been carried in all throughout the tumor. If you zoom in on one T cell labeled green here, on its surface we can see these particles. So even in vivo they crawl into the tissue with this uh, drug package. So that's providing evidence that this can work, that the cell can carry something into tissue. So now the question is, does that actually help with tumor therapy? So I'll show you just one experiment um, to, to wrap up here where we're going to treat a model of metastatic melanoma where we have uh, lung and bone marrow metastases in mice. And then we're going to track, I'm going to show you a method where we can watch inside the animals where the T cells are going. Um, so first we, we treated animals by just transferring in tumor-specific T cells. And if the T cells aren't given any supporting drug, then what you see is that the T cells uh, initially, or a few days later, they're at the sites where there's tumor. So this is the tumor image, and then these are the T cells. But then a week out, they die out, and they don't do the job of clearing the tumor. If we give them a single injection of some supporting drugs that are thought to promote their protection in vivo, uh, a single injection of drugs ac actually doesn't change the picture at all. But if we take that same dose of drug, a very small dose, and load it onto the T cell so that they carry it with them, you see this complete uh, change in the outcome where now the T cells go to the tumor, but then they begin proliferating, and they proliferate very extensively for several days. They clear all of the tumor in the animal, and then they become memory cells. So again, back to this idea of memory. Uh, where they're circulating, these signals that you see here are in the spleen and the lymph nodes of these animals. So they become memory cells that traffic and stick around looking for any tumor recurrence. And if you just take the simplest measure of uh, did the animal survive or not, um, untreated animals all uh, succumb by day 25 when they're not treated. If they get these control T cell treatments, they don't survive much better. Um, but when they're carrying their own drug in this model, they, they can completely cure the, uh, the tumor. So this is uh, looking promising, and now we're looking for more rigorous models to test in and, and looking at the steps it takes 
to move this toward testing in humans. And also one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how to do this without taking the T cells out of the body. Um, so can we inject particles that will find T cells in, in the patient and provide the same kind of stimulation without doing this laborious process of taking T cells out and growing them up? And that's uh, work that's still ongoing. So I'll stop there, and, and uh, I'd be glad to take questions uh, uh, to, about this idea um, that we think provides a way that you can um, eliminate side effects for drugs that might have serious toxicity, and a lot of immune-stimulating drugs will have toxicity if they're given at too high a dose, um, potentially increasing the potency of drugs, and it's a way to target drugs to tumor tissues. And uh, I, won't sh I haven't got time to show you, but we've also used this to deliver chemotherapy agents that the T cell carries into the tumor and then releases at the tumor um, to destroy it. So um, I'll just uh, stop there and, and acknowledge uh, the people in my lab that did this work, a, a talented postdoc, Natia Stefan, and two graduate students who are, who are carrying this on, Yuran Zhang and Bonnie Quang. So thanks for your attention. I'd be glad to see any questions. Questions? Do the nanoparticles stick around forever? No, and, and actually a limitation of the therapy in this first iteration is that they go away fairly quickly. So within about a week, the particles dissolve completely uh, and get resorbed. They're, the ones we're using here are made of lipids, so they get digested. Um, just as your, your natural lipids do. So one, one interesting question will be, as if we design particles that stick around a little bit longer and we increase the window of time that maybe we can keep stimulating the cells, what, what's the impact on the efficacy we can achieve? And that's something we're still trying to look at. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. The T cells also go to normal tissue where they may deliver for chemotherapy drugs to those do they go into normal tissue? Normal tissue. Um, so they they will traffic um, through most tissues in the body, and the trick is that they only get retained where they see their target. So um, the the T cells sort of modus operandi is to go everywhere looking for antigen, and if they find their target, they stay there, they proliferate. And so they'll accumulate over time. And so you will get them going through peripheral tissues that are not, uh, for example, tumor bearing, but they won't stay there if they don't find antigen. And that's how your immune system is normally patrolling and looking for danger. I'm wondering, just the advantage, what is the advantage of going with the nanoparticles versus just straight components of the tumor cell itself? <laughs> well, this is. <laughs> So the, when you go for something like the uh, vaccine approach that Glenn described, um, that's going to be the best of all worlds if you can expand the patient's own T cells in situ. And I think in the long run, what I would like to take with this technology is to marry it with approaches like Glenn's where you deliver the particles just with a neat syringe and they find T cells to boost um, because you're always going to be able to further enhance any response to a vaccine with the right mix of supporting drugs. And, and that's what Alan's going to show in a minute, um, is showing the earliest examples of that, not, not targeting in this way, but drugs that you can get benefit giving them all throughout the body. So, so the T cell therapy has the uh, ability to be extremely potent, but it's a lot tougher to clinically uh, implement. That's, that's a key. Here, one question. One of the implications of T cell therapy, the challenges has always been getting those T cells out of the patient and growing them in sufficient numbers that you could reinfuse them and obviously deal with the problem that they don't last very long. Is there a possibility that your technology would allow us to put far fewer T cells back in and therefore make it easier to start, if you will, therapy? Yeah, that's, that's definitely, and in fact, the drugs that we used in this first uh, experiment, that's essentially what they're doing, is, is greatly amplifying the number of T cells. You may be able to start with much fewer numbers of cells to begin with in treating a patient and make that, it easier. That's right. And combining that with the advances that are happening with um, gene engineering of T cells that Dr. Dranoff uh, mentioned, where we can take 
any T cell out of your blood from a blood sample and put a T cell receptor into that T cell that recognizes your tumor and then immediately put it back into the patient in the best case um, might make all of this a lot uh, more viable for widespread use. Fascinating. One more. Both the earlier speaker and you uh, are address different methodologies, but the, the big issue is the enhancing of the efficiency of the T cells. And yet both of you are reliant on the use of the patient's own T cells. So it is, it's not, if you will, a global approach. It is a patient-specific approach, which in the long run is very inefficient. So the question arises, is there any work being done, if it's even conceivable, to look to developing, if you will, a uniform T cell, one which is not patient specific? Yeah, so the, the, the main barrier to that idea is uh, that all of our immune systems are tuned to recognize ourselves and reject anyone else anyone else's cells. Understood. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the options are going down that road. Um, but at, what Alan's going to show you is that um, even though the uh, approach that I just showed here is sort of patient-specific therapy that is somewhat involved to take the cells out and put them back in, um, you can have something that's a quote-unquote global approach if a drug can simulate anyone's T cells in the right way. And I think that's where a lot of the excitement around the recent um, uh, approval of Irovoy and, and uh, some of the other drugs following it down the pipeline will be. Is they are using your own T cells, but they can be my T cells, they can be your T cells, and hopefully the majority of patients' T cells.